Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Phoenix Center Teleforum Federalism, Preemption, and Municipal Broadband Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, you will have the opportunity to ask questions during the question and answer session. You may register to ask a question at any time by pressing the star and one on your touchtone phone. You may withdraw yourself from the queue by pressing the pound key. Please note, this call may be recorded. I'll be standing by should you need any assistance. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to Mr. Larry Spywack. Good morning, everybody. My name is Larry Spywack. I'm the president of the Phoenix Center. We appreciate everybody joining us this morning. Uh, today, we're going to be holding a teleform. I'm glad everybody's going to join us on uh, federalism, preemption, and municipal broadband. Uh, this is a topic that's come back. The president has raised this in the State of the Union. Uh, the FCC is expected to vote on a preemption petition for the city of Chattanooga in its May meeting. So we thought it would be a good idea to both go over some of our recent research on municipal broadband as well as have a discussion with a panel of legal experts to talk about the FCC's uh, uh, legal authority to preempt state laws that restrict or prohibit municipal broadband. Um, to start things off, a couple of administrative notes. Uh, first, um, we have slides that uh, our chief economist, Dr. George Ford, will be going through. They are available right at the top of our website, www.phoenix-center.org. So if people want, if they're near their computer, want to go look, it's right at the top of what's new. You'll see a PDF file. Just click on that, and you can follow along with George. Uh, some of the papers that we're going to be talking today also are available on our website. If you go to the right of our website under the, our, the topics, you'll see a thing that says municipal broadband. Some of the papers we're going to be talking about are available there. Um, in terms of tweet, uh, tweeting today, for those people who want to be engaged in social media, uh, the hashtag we're going to be using today is the White House's official uh, hashtag, which is hashtag better broadband. We figure we may as well be relevant for the overall conversation. So again, this is going to be today's agenda. Um, I'm going to hand this off in about a minute to our chief economist, Dr. George Ford, who will walk through our recent research on this topic. After that, George will go for about 15 minutes. We will then have a discussion uh, on the FCC's legal authority with a panel of really just terrific lawyers, and I'll get to that in a moment. We've got Russ Hanser from Wilkinson Barker, uh, Brad Ramsey, who is the general counsel of NARUC, and Jeff Laning, who is the vice president of government affairs from CenturyLink. So without further ado, I will now turn this over to George. Um, George, take it away, please. Uh, I'll do it. Uh, we'll have the uh, slideshow if you have it. I'm, I apologize. I didn't. I think I've done this twice now for these things. Failed to number the pages. But at least on my browser, it'll tell you what page um, that we're on. And I'll start with what is page four on the uh, online page or the online presentation. Uh, and it's uh, basically just things we've written on this topic uh, or related to this topic that, that you might want to read. Uh, the most recent piece is the uh, Why Chattanooga is Not the Poster Child for Municipal Broadband. We just released that a few days ago, a couple of days ago. And uh, it's um, uh, an interesting piece. I'll go through most of it uh, in this presentation. Uh, the main point of this presentation is to discuss the uh, legal authority, and Larry has written a, a quite comprehensive piece uh, on that, published in Bloomberg. Uh, I also did last year a analysis of relative price prices, price offerings. I'll discuss that paper today across the municipal and uh, private sector. Uh, and I mentioned here another blog that I wrote on Susan Crawford's book. Uh, mainly uh, because I think th that there's an argument that b municipal broadband should be the only way that uh, broadband is provided in this country, and um, you know that's a debate that's a debate worth having, and it's just uh, just really hasn't been teed up uh, very uh, rigorously yet, but maybe one day it will. Uh, and then finally, competition after unbundling, uh, we will discuss a little bit today, and I discussed in the uh, poster child paper about what happens uh, to entry uh, or private sector provision of broadband when uh, you have municipal entry. And I'll, discover, I'll discuss that a little bit today. Uh, the next slide, page five, um, 
other things from me. Uh, about 10 years ago, I spent a pretty good bit of time thinking about municipal broadband, published a couple of papers uh, in that area, and actually uh, provided some advice to a municipal electric association on legislation. And these papers have uh, are published, and uh, the one I wrote with Tom Kowski on economic development is actually commonly cited. Uh, so I've been doing this for a very long time, um, at least 10 years, uh, on uh, on some pretty heavy thinking on municipal broadband. I kind of put it away for a while, so I'm having to dust off the cobwebs a little bit. Um, but the, uh, the question is, uh, on slide six, um, is municipal broadband a good idea? And I really don't know anybody that would say it's, it, it's never a good idea. I'm sure they're out there. Uh, but there are certainly issues um, where if the private sector won't provide uh, broadband infrastructure and the broadband infrastructure is sort of an essential uh, economic infrastructure today, uh, then you have to ask yourself whether or not you just uh, let your your city or your uh, your place go um, and have people move someplace where there is broadband, or do you take up the subsidy issue uh, yourself? We do have some subsidies, and we're trying to have more subsidies for broadband. It's not clear whether or not those subsidies will be sufficient to wire everywhere. I doubt they will be. Um, so it's natural for a city to say, I don't have it, I want to take it on. I think what's interesting about that is, um, for the most part, I think any municipal broadband system should largely be the only system in, the, in a market and should probably be subsidized forever. Uh, if it's profitable, uh, the odds are the private sector could have done it. So if they're providing where the private sector will not, it will not be profitable and therefore require some subsidization. I think what's interesting in the debate, and this happened quite early in the debate, is is what does unserved mean? Is it is it is it there's nothing there? Is it there's not what I want there? Are you underserved? And this was a big debate, and that's a pretty blurry uh, distinction, I think, and uh, one that requires some some careful consideration. Uh, on the next slide, I want to mention this because I think this is a big problem in the debate right now. Um, increasing competition is not a legitimate basis for municipal broadband systems. Uh, the governments don't compete uh, with the private sector. Competition occurs between uh, profit-maximizing firms who don't have a number of distinct advantages uh, that the government has. Uh, so I think that's a poor justification. And, and I've advised municipals uh, not to go that route. Um, I don't think they're getting as good advice today. We weren't getting very good advice earlier either, uh, when you when you make the competition argument, then you're going to run into things, advantages, do you pay taxes, do you have access to rights of way, uh, tax revenues, uh, municipal debt rates, those sorts of things, which means you're uh, an advantage competitor. So it just never makes sense to talk about it in terms of competition, and it's not. Having the government enter in a subsidized way is not competition. It's, uh, it's a profound market distortion. So I think that's just a a, a bad idea even to talk about it that way or even to think about it that way. Uh, and as I mentioned here, there's the big question of whether all broadband should be provided by the government, and, and I think that's a debate that that should be had. Um, I think that my uh, answer would be no, but I think it's a, a debate worth having, and there's some people certainly uh, making that argument. I want to begin with uh, uh, the analysis we we did on, on price comparisons um, and reiterate that it's not really about competition, but people are talking about it in those terms, so I guess I'll uh, um, take that on on the same grounds. <clears throat> Around slide, uh, well, I guess it's slide nine, um, we see a statement by, uh, this was from Mark Cooper uh, from the CFA, Municipal wire line broadband service providers offer much more attractive triple play services um, than uh, um, other providers, and by attractive he meant lower prices. At least that's what this analysis focused on. And uh, and then we have in the next slide where we had a recent article in Time Magazine that talked about how municipal entry uh, drove down prices uh, for service. Uh, what and there's been some analysis on prices and and most of it is is pretty dreadful 
um, the first thing you've got to do when you compare prices is try to compare apples to oranges, or apples to apples as much as you can, not apples to oranges, which is what we typically see. And admittedly, this sometimes can be difficult in, in a place like Chattanooga, where they uh, their lowest quality, uh, lowest uh, bandwidth offering is 100 megabits. Um, but you want to try to get as close as you can to um, to the same sort of package. And I think that a 50 megabit circuit probably for most people is indistinguishable from a 100 megabit circuit. And we have to make those calls, but be honest about it when you do. If we look at the slide there on Bristol, Virginia. Um, what I've done here is compared uh, Comcast to BVU's prices, and I got a, a, the same uh, bandwidth circuit, a 30 megabit circuit. I've got uh, 175 versus 180 channels of television, and then a full um, a full service voicemail, all those sorts of things, caller ID, and unlimited usage phone service, and just see what it would cost. It cost about $110 for Comcast and $150 for BVU. Um, so we see, and this was done last January, uh, keep that in mind, um, we see a, a $40 difference um, where the muni's price is higher than, uh, than Comcast. If you look at Lafayette, Louisiana, and the next one, you see similar comparisons, um, 18 megabit, 25 megabit, 15 megabit circuits. So they're roughly the same um, broadband service. Uh, channels, you know, 370 channels for AT&T. I'm sorry, that should be uh, it's, uh, not uh, BVU there. That's the Lafayette system, um, LUS. Uh, the TV channels, 290 channels. So these are similar packages. And again, the uh, Muni system is higher. And then you have Cox Cable, who's there as well, offering a, a slightly better broadband service little fewer channels, but the price is um, also lower. And then finally, in, in Chattanooga, you see between Comcast and EPB, the prices are roughly the same for a, uh, a similar triple play package. at about $140 for Comcast and $140 uh, dollars for, uh, for EPB. Verizon is not in Chattanooga, but um, it offers a similar package to these for about $90 across uh, its footprint. Uh, but again, in the Chattanooga case, you're comparing a 50 megabit circuit to a 100 megabit circuit. Um, it's not clear that people would notice the difference, but that is uh, worth noting, and that's, that's the closest comparison I could get at, 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 in January last year. Uh, I think what's really interesting about these price comparisons is, the, is how they reflect back to the nature of the debate on municipal broadband. Uh, first of all, we see the prices are quite similar, and, and in some cases you might find higher or lower prices depending on how you package the thing together and what you're looking at, but the prices are not radically different uh, and in almost any case, um, say on a gigabit circuit, which may not even be available by, uh, from some people uh, in some markets from the private sector. Um, but private firms are profit maximizers and municipal systems are not. I mean, presumably the municipal system sort of aimed at a a break-even type financial model. So the fact that the prices are somewhat similar suggests that, that the competition in the broadband industry is, is fairly intense, intense enough to get you into a, essentially a break-even um, situation, at least close to that. Um, and then also that the um, that a third wire to the home is not going to make a huge difference. Um, in prices, because you have markets that have a, a, a essentially a third entrant in the form of municipal zero profit uh, entrant, and the prices are not that radically different. And then slide 17, I think it, it's also interesting to note that while we complain a lot about prices being $20 in Latvia or whatever for a triple play, which is also a, uh, a number that's that's constructed by people who don't know what they're doing apparently. Um, but it doesn't solve the problem. I mean, they're, they're, the, the municipal systems prices are quite comparable, so whatever disadvantage we might have uh, in terms of prices relative to other countries' alleged uh, disadvantage is not going to be solved uh, by municipal entry. But again, these municipal systems, most of them, uh, or many of them, are brand new. At least the ones we point to are new. They're fiber. They offer... Um, very high bandwidth products just by the nature uh, of being new. And turning to the Model City, which is a paper we released um, 
earlier this week, um, and and that was uh, Chairman Wheeler's, and I think also the White House to some extent, sort of pointing to Chattanooga as a um, as a benchmark for uh, or as a model uh, for municipal broadband. And I mean, the Chattanooga experience is an interesting one. Um, I think they're having some success for various reasons uh, there. Um, but we have to think about how generalizable, which I think the chairman is trying to generalize the Chattanooga experience to other cities, and, and I think that's quite dangerous uh, and misleading and, and perhaps even dishonest for a number of reasons. Um, the first reason, about slide 20, um, is that um, in Chattanooga you have a municipal, broad, a municipal electric uh, system that's providing the broadband. Only about 15% of the country has a municipal electric, and obviously being in the electricity business is going to provide you with uh, some benefits, some potential spillovers from your electric to your broadband division. You know about running wires, you know how to, you have the equipment to hang things on telephone poles and run it through conduit, and and you deal with customers and you deal with bills and, and, and you have people driving trucks around. So there's there's a, a lot of opportunity for legitimate spillovers between the electric division and the broadband division. Uh, so naturally these systems would would tend to be uh, better run and and have uh, more expertise and and and, are, and be more likely to succeed. But but there also come with that some some questionable issues and that is to what extent is the electric side being used to finance uh, the broadband side? And we see a lot of that in, in, in some of these municipal systems where there are some somewhat shady um, shady deals uh, being run between the two. Um, whether or not that's true in Chattanooga is, is unclear. I know that, that the system has argued that, that the, there are a lot of benefits to the broad, uh, electric customer uh, from the uh, broadband, and so some of the costs can be shifted over that way. And also that the if the thing was a total bust, that the electric customer would have had to, to pick up that tab. Um, I also think what's interesting, and this was in a footnote in the paper, is that we you have all these advantages from the electric division to the broadband division, but we don't see uh, the investor-owned utilities doing these sorts of things, which I think is is interesting and and I think is primarily a regulatory issue. We have we have we have the president and the chairman of the FCC trying to push municipal broadband and make it easier for them to enter, but nobody has has even thought about the uh, private sector electric utilities uh, getting in this business who serve 85 percent of the customers. Um, so I think that's an, an interesting distinction. Um, I think also that that the in any municipal situation, it's very hard to get a real clear look at the finances. Uh, and in fact, in the in the case up in Burlington, Vermont, you ended up having the FBI and some others involved trying to figure out uh, what what went wrong uh, there and how the finances were being handled. Uh, slide 21. The other issue is that about a third of the the uh, construction cost of the Chattanooga system were paid for by the federal government in the form of a grant, not even a loan, but a grant. And that's about a $2,000 per customer gift uh, from people from the federal government, which means people who don't live in Chattanooga. So you, people living in Washington, D.C. and people living in Birmingham, Alabama are actually paying for uh, an uh, advanced broadband system in Chattanooga, which I think should should bother people a little bit, and then the question becomes, well, if we want to have broadband everywhere and you need a third of your network paid for by the government, by the federal government, will that price tag be in about $220 billion by my uh, uh, rough calculations? I also think it's interesting when you, the government hands $111 million to somebody to build a network in, in one city. Um, what that would look like if the government was equally supportive um, at least relatively uh, supportive of a private sector company. If, if, and I use an example of Comcast here in, in, in the slide, slide 22. If, um, if the government were to give sort of the homes past equivalent amount of money uh, that it gave to Chattanooga to Comcast, that'd be about 35 billion dollars. 
uh, that's about 11, 10, 11 years worth of Comcast CapEx. Uh, I wonder what Comcast would be offering with that sort of cash infusion to build network. Um, it probably wouldn't be a whole lot different than what we're seeing in, in Chattanooga, but there's no uh, interest. In fact, I think really what we're, we're looking at right now is the federal government's attempt to sabotage the private sector broadband provision while uh, promoting uh, government provision of broadband, and maybe that comes from this idea that the government should be the provider of, of all broadband service. I don't know. Um, the subsidization brings up another issue, and that is the issue of economic, uh, the benefits of these networks, slide 23. If you listen to much of the discussion on the economic benefits of these networks, most of it is uh, relocation. It's attracting businesses. Businesses leave one town and go to another. And while this is great for cities, and, this, and I think that you know, a city that says, I want to build one of these things for, to save my economy, that's one thing. But it's not clear to me why the federal government is interested in having business leave one area and go to another, which is really what they're doing with these, with these schemes. I mean, you're, you're actually using tax dollars from one, one city, one state, to subsidize uh, broadband in another state, and then business leaves your state. So you're actually paying to have your business stolen from you. Uh, so I, as a federal, at the federal level, it's just not clear to me what the payoff of this is, not to say that broadband won't add some net gain, uh, or better broadband add some net gain, but most of the gain is, is uh, in these cases, is probably just moving the econo uh, economic activity from one city to another city. So it's not clear to me why that goes. And you look at a, a place like Burlington or, or some other city that's had built a system that's failed, uh, they're unlikely to to uh, try again, and those cities will never be able to benefit from this. So you basically got a federal policy that is out to uh, destroy uh, certain cities to some extent. Um, so I, you know, I think this is a state, this is a local issue, not a not a federal issue. Um, the uh, finally, there's a uh, what we might call a crowding out effect, and that. You know, the, the number of broadband providers in most areas is a small number, and there's a reason it's a small number, and that is because it's a very expensive and difficult business. And you can't just say, oh, well, I want more competition, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a competitor. That's not how markets work. If you add another competitor through some scheme, subsidization, grants, whatever it may be, essentially the market's going to clear at some point, and, and there's a, a pretty good chance somebody's going to have to leave or, or else – uh, reduce their uh, investment in an area, and I think there's some evidence uh, of that happening, and we may hear more about that later, where, you know, you've, there's greener grass. I mean, one of the issues, interesting, when I was working in the in the uh, uh, advising a municipal client, one of the things was the cities felt that they couldn't get the attention of the private sector because there's just greener grass, which is better places to invest. Well, if you've got a, a government coming in and providing broadband and taking the half market share, I think the average penetration is over 50% for a municipal broadband system, uh, then the grass is greener elsewhere and companies will start relocating their investment. The private sector will start relocating its investment um, elsewhere. Some people would say, I guess that's a good thing. Uh, some people would say, um, say that it's not. But we do you do need to keep in mind that it's not we're not just adding a third competitor because we feel like adding a third competitor. You're injecting a third competitor in a market that probably can only uh, hold two, uh, maybe two and a half in some in some sense, and that's going to run off uh, run off investment. And we've actually seen some smaller um, carriers. I think some. Uh, wireless uh, broadband, fixed uh, wireless providers in the Chattanooga area complaining about the government subsidization of a, um, uh, of a government system that has prohibited or limited their ability uh, to expand. So I think that's, uh, that's going to be there. I don't think we've seen a lot of evidence um, of it yet. Not that it hasn't happened, it's just that the evidence hasn't, uh, hasn't been accumulated. And that about sums it up. Uh, there's a lot more, of course, to talk about on this very complex issue, but this is a legal discussion, so I'll turn it over to the uh, to the scholars. 
Thank you very much, George. Okay, having dispensed with the economics, we're now going to talk about the legal Im uh, implications of preemption. Uh, again, as I said at the outset of our teleform, we've had very lucky to have joined us uh, three very, very talented lawyers with a lot of experience. And uh, first, we have Russ Hanser, who's a partner over at Wilkinson Barker. We have Brad Ramsey, who's the general counsel of NARUC, and Jeff Landing, who's the vice president of uh, federal regulatory affairs over at CenturyLink. Um, before we get into this discussion, I think I want to make it very clear that what's important about the legal aspect of it, and the Supreme Court has recognized this, is that the merits of municipal broadband really have no bearing on the legal question here, which is the ability of whether or not the FCC has preemption authority over state broadband laws. Uh, the Supreme Court, I just, I actually want to read the quote from uh, the Nixon case, which said the Supreme Court ran out of the way, it's quote, it is well to put aside, close quote, the public policy arguments favoring municipal broadband to support any, quote, generous conception of preemption, close quote. Why? Because the issue of preemption is one of statutory interpretation, interpretation and as such, quote, the issue does not turn on the merits of municipal telecommunication services. And I think that's what we want to focus on, on the legal uh, portion of this panel. Um, to, to walk through the law on this and to see whether or not the FCC has the authority. Tom Wheeler says he has the authority, I'm not sure, but let's start at the beginning. My, my first question is to Jeff. Jeff, if you could just very quickly walk us through why the FCC gave, uh, why Congress gave the FCC some preemption on 253. Are there examples where the FCC has used this authority effectively in the past? Um, are there other questions? Just sort of walk us through what the FCC's preemption authority is now. Okay, uh, thank you, Larry. And um, so 253, which actually you'll hear more about a Nixon case later, was used, uh, well, the FCC's ability to use that to preempt municipal broadband actually was was re uh, reversed uh, in the Nixon case. But it, it, is, it is its core uh, preemption uh, provision with respect to competition. Uh, in telecommunications. Um, basically, the, the core idea is that the FCC does not have the ability to prohibit or hinder any entity's ability to enter and compete in telecommunications markets. Uh, the reason for that was very straightforward. In 1996, when the statute was passed, we still had franchise local monopoly telephone companies. Um, and so there was not unanimity in the country uh, that we should actually moved to competition, and indeed, shortly after the, the statute was passed and, and enacted into law, um, there were a number of, the FCC had the opportunity and to, to deal with a number of provisions in various states that either still tried to prohibit competition or impose unreasonable requirements on entities that were trying to compete. For example, the first case was in Kansas where they were actually flat out tried to refuse cert certification to some entities in some places. Um, there was a case in Connecticut that had tried to limit what CELEX could provide. I think they were trying to deny them payphone services there. The big case, uh, was sort of the first really big case was in Texas, where the state of Texas tried to say that if someone wanted to compete with Southwestern Bell, or actually not just with Southwestern Bell, with an ILEC, they had to build out the entire area in, in, in competition, um, which is sort of a really uh, onerous barrier to entry, very standard uh, economics. So all those preemptions were upheld. Um, that that legacy uh, would not, would, I don't think, looking at what we're looking at today, is, is sort of very different than the current situation. I think, for example, the city of Wilson has sought preemption of the North Carolina law. It claims as a barrier to entry. And and when, when one reads that, a number of the provisions actually are really just level playing field provisions, like number four, uh, sort of, so what is this, uh, sort of section A.4 A, A says that the, no municipality shall directly or indirectly use the powers of the city to force people to buy the local municipality's broadband service. Or that, seems like a perfectly reasonable pro-competitive provision. Don't know how you could say that's a, a barrier to entry. Um, in fact, the provision itself would be a barrier to entry in some sense. I mean, if the municipality were able to do these things. And that continues. Uh, municipalities are not covered by pole attachment statutes, so the law says, you know what, if you're going to be here, you got to let other people get on your poles the same way that 
they can get you know that you can get on their polls. Um, don't use special advertising. Don't cross subsidize from other services that are municipal services. You know, all all basic things that one would think would not be covered by this kind of preemption. So it'll be very interesting to see how the SEC deals with that. And I, it's worth noting why we have these statutes. The history, and George touched on this a bit, but the history in in municipal. Uh, both cable, because this happened a lot in the early days of cable. And of course, most of those systems, it turned out, ended up being sold because there was economies of scale and it's a difficult business. Um, but in broadband, the very, very mixed history. And one classic leading case is in Utopia, Utah. And um, tons of money's been sunk into this. It hasn't worked. And actually, to this day, um, the people of Ut Utopia have to pay a fee to cover the debt of the existing of, of the municipal provider, whether or not they buy from it or not, um, and that leads to the the key point that George made of this diminishing investments, competitive investments. So the that, that circular logic gets back to in an, either 253 or frankly the FCC tries to go with 706. The history suggests that um, sort of trying to put level playing field restrictions on municipalities rather than being a barrier to competition, probably enhances competition. So, All right. Well, the main case that, that the FCC dealt with with, with municipal t uh, utility laws was a case called Nixon versus Missouri mm -hmm. Municipal League. And, Ross, if you, wouldn't be, if you would be so kind, if you could sort of walk us through the procedural posture of that case, what it was about, how the FCC ruled, and then how the Supreme Court ruled, so set the background for what we're going to talk about. Sure. I, <clears throat> sure, I'd be happy to. And actually, I'm going to. Um, uh, and thanks for having me, by the way. Uh, step back, and you know, as often with big legal cases, there are other cases before them that have some relevance. So I'm going to start actually with this uh, city of Abilene, this, this Texas matter, uh, which was a, wound up as a D.C. Circuit case. So in 1997, right after Congress passed and the president signed Section 253, the FCC w was asked to consider a. a uh, whether whether Section 253 authorized preemption of this Texas law uh, regarding provision of telecom, uh, and the agency did in fact preempt parts of the law, but said Section 53, 253 did not empower to preempt uh, this this um, provision precluding Texas localities from operating private uh, telecom services. And so the FCC in that matter held that Texas the Texas municipalities were not entities under the terms of Section 253, which says that, you know, entities, uh, it, it, it could um, preempt actions by entities. Uh, so they were not entities separate and apart from the state of Texas uh, for the purposes of applying Section 253A, and that preempting the enforcement of the prohibition would insert the commission into the relationship between the state of Texas and its own political subdivisions in a manner that wasn't intended by the statute. Uh, in that decision, the FCC relied on a 1967 Supreme Court case called Sailors versus Board of Education of Kent County, which held that political subdivisions of states never were and never have been considered sovereign entities, rather have been regarded as subordinate governmental instrumentalities created by the state to assist in the carrying out of state governmental functions. That's a theme that remains important in this debate and, and through my remarks here. Uh, so, according to the Commission, the, the scope of authority that a state affords its subdivision traditionally was a matter within the purview of the states, and if Congress had intended to remove the state's prerogatives in, the, in those areas, it has to make its intentions clear. Uh, the Commission thought it hadn't. Uh, that case went up to the D.C. Circuit, which uh, held in the Commission's favor, it agreed that 253 did not authorize that kind of preemption. Uh, the Court relied substantially on a different Supreme Court case, Gregory v. Ashcroft from 1991, uh, which had said, which held that uh, where federal preemption would upset the constitutional balance of federal and state powers, such preemption is only permissible if Congress has made its intention to preempt unmistakably clear. Um, and then it said, even assuming arguendo, wasn't even sure, but even assuming arguendo that Congress could supersede a state law limiting the powers of its own subdivisions, uh, interfering with that kind of relationship strikes very close to the heart of state sovereignty and federal law can't be interpreted to reach into those areas without being clear, and it, ha it had Section 253A was not clear in that intent as to that intention. Uh, so then, okay, so that, that case exists. That brings us to this Nixon uh, matter. So in 2001, the, the FCC was faced with a request from municipalities and municipal organizations and municipally owned uh, utilities in Missouri, uh, and it again held that it lacked authority to preempt state 
uh, anti-muni network laws uh, under 253, it again concluded that the term any entity was not intended uh, to include political subdivisions of the state, rather appears to prohibit restrictions on market entry that apply to independent entities subject to state regulation. Uh, petitioners sought review in the Eighth Circuit, which had not ruled on the case. Um, and the Eighth Circuit in, in, uh, in I guess, Missouri, Missouri, I forget which, which side was which, but in Nixon versus Missouri, in the Missouri Municipal League, uh, reversed the commission's ruling and established a circuit split. Uh, as an aside, the Nixon in this case refers to Jay Nixon, who at the time was Attorney General of Missouri, and more recently in the last eight months or so has come to prominence as the governor of Missouri in the um, sort of the attention that's been paid to the Ferguson events. Um, so uh, the case goes up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court effectively sides with the D.C. Circuit and with the FCC. Um, it says Section 253 does not allow preemption of state anti-immunity laws, uh, sometimes like for those gone, anti-gone laws, government-operated networks. Um, notably, only one justice on the court dissented from the main ruling. That was Justice Stevens. Uh, Justices Scalia and Thomas dissented in part, but not on issues that are relevant here. They dissented to some sort of arguably extraneous language in the order about um, what municipalities can do on their own. Uh, but the majority, uh, which included both Scalia and Thomas, found that uh, preemption of such laws, anti-community laws, was not comparable to other kinds of preemption because preemption generally removes the state restriction rather than affirmatively requiring the state to take action. And I think it's worth reading kind of two paragraphs, so I'm going to read and hopefully not take up too much time. But uh, the court said, in familiar instances of regulatory preemption under the Supremacy Clause, that's the part of the Constitution that authorizes preemption in the first place, a federal measure preempting state regulation in some precinct of economic conduct carried on by a private person or corporation simply leaves the private party free to do anything it chooses consistent with the prevailing federal law. If federal law, say, preempts state regulation of cigarette advertising, a cigarette seller is left free from advertising restrictions imposed by a state, which is left without the power to control on that matter. On the subject covered, state law just drops out. But no such simple result would follow from federal preemption meant to unshackle local governments from entrepreneurial limitations. The trouble is that a local government's capacity to enter an economic market turns not only on the effect of straightforward economic regulation below the national level, including outright bans, but on the authority and potential will of government at the state or local level to support entry into the market. Preemption of the state advertising restriction freed a seller who otherwise had the legal authority to advertise and the money to do it if it had made that if it had made economic sense. But preempting a ban on government utilities would not accomplish much if the government could not point could not point to some law authorizing it to run a utility in the first place. That's the end of the quote. So uh, as a result, the state that wished to deprive localities of the power to build and operate networks um, could just simply not not delegate that power to its sub entity, its the locality in the first place, um, and that would leave the commission with nothing to preempt. So uh, in that case, there would be no authority of, uh, held by the locality. As the Supreme Court pointed out, there, there's no argument that the Telecom Act of 96 is itself a source of federal authority granting municipalities local power that state law does not. Uh, it's worth noting as an aside here that that uh, language was written at a time when Section 706 existed. Um, and the court said no argument that Telecom Act of 96 is a source of federal authority for localities. Uh, and then given the fact that different states afforded different localities different powers, the court held that Section 253 preemption would often accomplish nothing. We treat states differently depending on the formal structures of their laws authorizing municipalities to function. In other words, whether they broadly granted municipalities authority to do everything they wanted or whether they gave them very specific enumerated powers that did or did not include the, the power to operate networks uh, and would hold out no promise of national consistency. Uh, I just want to say, uh, I guess, two things about Nixon before I turn back over. The first is that Nixon was not a Chevron case. So um, in, in a case like, for example, the Verizon decision regarding open Internet, the issue has, and, fr and frankly, the Brand X case at the Supreme Court, the issue has been uh, FCC has decided certain things, and we, the court, are only authorized to decide whether that's reasonable. Um, that's not what this court was doing. It doesn't. It never once mentioned Chevron. In fact, the Nixon case, uh, the court was really saying, uh, this is not what we see the statute doing, and it didn't give any sign that it would hold otherwise if the commission had favored the opposite position. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing I want to note, we can talk more about this in the discussion, but 
the arguments now that are raised, we'll get into the Section 706 arguments, but I think it's worth thinking about Nixon. Um, I'm sorry, when thinking about Nixon, I think it's worth recalling that that rationale did not have a lot to do with the language of Section 253. It had a lot to do with the nature of the relationship between the states and the, their sub-entities and whether the federal government could interpose in that re- itself into that relationship. Um, and I think that means that Nixon winds up having a lot more relevance whether or not we're talking about Section 253 specifically. In fact, there's an argument that the logic of Nixon, which uh, says you have to have a very clear statement of an intent to preempt, uh, you could you could argue that that is actually a weaker case in, with respect to Section 253, which affirmatively talks about preemption, than it does with respect to Section 706, which never once mentions preemption. Anyway, so with that, I will turn it back over to Larry. Larry. Thanks, Russ. That was excellent. Okay, so now we've got the background of Section 253. We've got the background of the Nixon case. And yet, we've now we've had public statements by FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler presumably post the Verizon VFCC case with the use of Section 706, where Tom Wheeler has said, I believe I have the authority and I intend to use that authority to preempt state laws that restrict or prohibit municipal broadband. Um, and this is where I'd like to turn over to Brad. Brad, assuming it, he, he's, the chairman tends to use 706, is there a plausible legal argument here under Section 706 to allow the FCC to preempt state laws in this particular circumstance? Let me preface my remarks by saying I don't think that Congress, I mean, the whole idea that a municipality gains its authority from either the state constitution or the state legislature was actually brought by the first, and back in the 1880s, the very first uh, president of my association, Nehruk, uh, went to the Supreme Court of the United States kind of arguing that, uh, that authority could come from somewhere else through federal law. And the United States Supreme Court, I can't even remember the dates, it's upheld the Dillon Rule twice. The Dillon Rule basically says that these municipalities are organs of the state government. So if they don't have authority, I don't think that there's any provision in the Telecommunications Act that gets you by the Tenth Amendment. It's interesting when I hear these statements that, well, they're saying that Congress has to come up with a greater uh, or a stronger uh, statement of preemption, but how do you the the problem with the analysis always is the only authority that the municipality has is what the state has given it, and preemption uh, federal law. This is a, an interesting thing that always runs through this, and, and representing the states, I, I hear a lot. People have this idea that the, the supremacy clause means for. In, in some sense, that the federal government can give the state jurisdiction when the state legislature or the state constitution has not. And that's a enormous falsehood. And, and I can cite an easy example. You know, neighbors, the people that I represent uh, are, just like a municipality, an organ of state you, We are authorized by state legislatures and, in some cases, by uh, state constitutions. Uh, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 says that uh, we're, we're supposed to do ETC designations, and yet a number of states don't do essential telecommunications uh, de- uh, design- eligible t- uh, telecommunications carrier designations uh, for wireless carriers. And why don't they do that? They don't do that because their state legislature has not given them authority over wireless telecommunications services in any form. So they can't do it, even though Congress wants them to do it. Another example from the Telecommunications Act. In Section 254, uh, it pretty much says that we're supposed to have state universal service programs. Uh, Only 23 states do. Why is that? Because the legislature made a choice, and the state public service commissions are organs of the state legislature, and they can't decide just because they think it's a good idea that they can get and they can, you know, make an explicit state universal service program. So, you know, I... uh, Nehru never takes never took position on whether the policy of getting you know allowing municipal broadband entry is a good idea or a bad idea. That's for people far above my pay grade. But when I look at this, I I think that the statutory analysis is secondary, and that the the primary place to look is the Constitution of the United States. Uh, I I've been on a couple of places where this has been discussed, and there'll always be someone who says, well, what about Brad? If if the government gave them uh, authority to get into the broadband business, but just limited where they could do it. And that's not really a different question. 
because, again, the authority that they have is limited by the state government to a specific amount, and the federal government can't come in and say, you know what, you've got to give them authority to do why. This is not like dealing with a private entity. The, the example that I used in the comments I filed was, uh, you know, nobody would suggest that the FCC could order a private business that doesn't currently engage in uh, jurisdictional utility operations to engage in broadband service. Even it's a good policy idea. So if there's a if there's a Walmart or some big holding company that has a, a bunch of businesses and one of their subsidiaries wants to get into the broadband business, the CEO of that subsidiary can't go to the FCC and say, you know what, Walmart's not letting me get into the wall, into the uh, uh, broadband business, and I think it's a great idea. Well, if, I understand you right, and even the rest of the panel right. I mean. I guess it was 2005, 2006 when they were trying to pass the COPE Act. Uh, there was even trying to be a insert some municipal broadband language into that law. If I hear the panel correctly, there's a general agreement that even that the United States Congress could not pass a law that could give the FCC preemption authority in this particular instance. Am I right about that? Am I picking that up correctly? That's, well, that's can, my position. That's my position. I don't think that it's constant. I don't. Regardless, actually, 253 is a is a if you're going to allow preemption, 706, you know, if we, if we talked about it in the context of a private entity, uh, then 273, if broadband Internet access or broadband is a telecommunication service, 273 is a better place to go. But you, 706, 706, I don't think even under traditional preemption analysis, 706 gives you very much of a leg to stand on because it gives, if you look at the statute, Presumably, to the extent it is an independent uh, source of authority, and that's what the D.C. Circuit says, I, I don't know that I personally agree with their analysis, but if it is an independent grant of authority, it's a co-equal grant of authority. The states have equivalent authority, and there's nothing in there about preemption. There's only well, about promoting the deployment of advanced services. And preemption, and there's a whole slew of case law on this, is has to be ex – there's a presumption against it in the statute – and the fact is that there there are a whole lot of provisions where it's where, pre, where preemption is kind of laid out, and in 253, I'd say I I haven't gotten as or thought as much about this because I really don't think 253, which is the most uh, the strongest preemption language in the statute as far as I, uh, you know from the state's perspective, uh, and I don't think that it matters. I think as a as a constitutional matter. Dillon's rule has been upheld twice. I can't probably actually more than twice, but I know it was upheld twice. This is a Dillon rule case. I can't imagine the Supreme Court taking this. I can imagine a, a United States Court of Appeals. Uh, I think it would be unusual, but I could see that, that it could happen that a United States Court of Appeals could decide that. But I don't think you'd ever get to the Supreme Court, even with its current composition. Well, well let me ask you the, the panel this question. I mean, first off, just going back two related questions. The first one is, as we've just said, if there is preemption authority, it's got to be explicit. And people read my, my little mini law review I did for Bloomberg. The thing that immediately dropped off, popped out for me was there's no word preemption at all in Section 706, which I think the panel's agreed on. So I'm not sure how you can – there's the word forbear, but the concept of forbearance and preemption are two very different things. Um, but, but this is what is interesting that you just raised something really interesting, Brad, and, and this is something that we've, we've highlighted in our research. Section 706 gives co-equal authority um, to the FCC and to the states. It's, it's an and, not an or. And so if under Verizon, if, if the FCC thinks that it's got authority to do preemption, then the same logic must apply to any state commission with jurisdiction over telecommunications. Would we, if the FCC were to proceed with this logic, would that mean that a state PUC could uh, preempt its own legislature's laws under the same logic that the FCC are, might proceed? That's an interesting thought. Well, <laughs> I mean, I said before, popped out to me. Yeah. Uh, you can't, and that's that's part of the flaw. But it goes back to the fact that you have to. I always explain, and I've had this conversation with a lot of uh, state attorneys, attorneys that represent state people. I always say, guys, you know, when you're doing your law. You have to cite to something in the state statute that tells you you have that authority. You can't cite uh, to the 1996 Act because all the 1996 Act does is it confirms that you have authority to do certain things. It cannot be the source of your authority. Your state legislature is the source of your authority. Federal legislation can only preempt. Yeah. It can't give authority. So with these, these grants of authority – typically are partial preemptions because what they do is they'll say, well, you can do this, and they're really saying, 
you can't do that because if it weren't for the telecommunications of 1996, those of us that went to law school remember the old minimum contacts cases. Well, if it weren't for the 1996 Act, then the states could do everything that minimum contacts would allow, which would include most uh, a whole lot more than they do right now, I guess, yeah. suffice to say. So when the, FC, when the 1996 Act gives authority, uh, the authority is, is, is limited at the state level by what the state is allowed by its state legislature to do, right. and the municipalities are in the very same situation. I, you know, I'm going to follow that sort of in simple terms. Um, it's, if the people of state, you know, putting aside the benefits or not of municipal networks, and I will point out that most of the world had government-owned telecom networks for most of the 20th century, and the results were uniformly so poor that we got an international treaty whereby everyone got governments out of telecom networks. So, but putting, putting that aside, um, the, 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 if the people of state X – doesn't matter what state, and you know we can raise questions or throw cast aspersions on the legislative process, but that's, it is what it is. If the people of state X decide that they don't want their state government and its subsidiaries, which include municipalities, doing something, I do not see how the FCC or, frankly, even Congress can step in and say, "No, you people, you must have your state do that thing." State doesn't want to do it. State doesn't want to do it. I don't know what the, how Congress could make them do it. Right. I, I agree with that. And another way to phrase that is, uh, you know, under the view of what the states are and what the localities are that's expressed in the Nixon decision and, and throughout, I think, the Supreme Court's jurisprudence, you know, the state doesn't have to have localities at all, right? The state, but for administrative necessity, could just say, we are the state, we are setting the law for everything. States choose to break up and delegate, uh, delegate authority for administrative purposes, uh, but the idea that the state could could choose to exert control throughout the state and adopt its statewide policy, in this case, an anti-immunity broadband policy, but that it once it decides to break up the jurisdiction for administrative reasons, it has to allow its, its uh, sub-entities to do things it would not do itself, is seems preposterous. So let me ask this, because we're coming up on the 11 uh, on, on, on the noon hour, and I appreciate everybody hanging in. Given our conversation um, and it's the, the, the extremely high likelihood that Chairman Wheeler is going to use some sort of legal theory to grant preemption in the Chattanooga case um, in February, just a quick lightning round, what um, are the odds that this is going to be overturned on appeal both at the D.C. Circuit, if it goes to the D.C. Circuit, or eventually the Supreme Court? Brad, what are the, what are the odds of being overturned? Uh, at some level, 100%. Jeff, um, as uh, I was trained as a lawyer to never to go 100 percent, but I would come as close to that as as, as 99.9. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, weird things always happen, but yeah, we're we're talking extremely likely to be overturned. Russ, yeah, I mean, I'd say you know I'm conservative like Jeff, so I'd say 85 to 90 percent. And by the way, I think it fares worse in the Supreme Court than it does at the D.C. Circuit because of the federalism issues Brad mentioned. So, as we're all telecom professionals. Why do you think we're doing Is this just for show? I mean, you've got the White House making this a central issue. Why, putting aside, why are we going through this exercise? I mean, one of the things I found fascinating in the, the uh, Nixon case, when you read the FCC order, it was actually granted on Bill Kennard's last day, and it was voted th unanimous by a Democrat-run FCC. And i got to imagine that the general counsel, who was probably Chris Wright at the time, said, you know, Bill – I'd love to do it, but you've got a real legal problem. And if you read Kennard's uh, concurrent statement, because I really want to grant this, but we don't have the authority. Why? Why are we doing this now? Is this it was just actually, for political show? It was John Dechterlein, actually. He oh, was it John? Okay. At the end, but go ahead. Who was also a very, very talented lawyer, and now the general counsel of the Federal Trade Commission. So I mean, my point I mean, is, we, oh, I, so basic I, politics. You know, the FCC has a role. It's quasi-legislative. Um, you know, legislatures sometimes pass laws that they, they can't because they feel like there's, there, you know, that's what the democracy wants. Um, you know, that's what people want. I don't know. Certain yeah, interests I mean, want this. By, by the time, by the time this gets to the Supreme Court, or by the time this gets decided by the Supreme Court, President Obama is going to be serving as the most popular professor at University of Chicago Law School, right? Or, or, or whatever he else he decides to do. It's so far in the future. There's a political bang for the buck now. Uh, you know, and 
you know, at least three of us have, have worked in the commission, uh, you know, OGC has its say, and it tells the chairman uh, what the legal risk is, but that's not necessarily the last word, and sometimes political considerations overturn the, over, overrule those legal considerations. Well, let me just say this. You know, even <laughs> people that trust me to be right on guessing what the courts will do are frequently disappointed. So so who knows what the federal court's going to do, and, and I will say this. I... The one thing, not the one thing, but one of the things that has pressed, uh, impressed me about Mr. Wheeler uh, is if, if he really thinks it's the right thing to do, this is my personal view, if, if, he, if he thinks it's the right policy, I think he'll do it, uh, and, and he'll roll the die even if he's getting advice that it's, uh, it's a, 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 it, may not, it may not have a good chance. It may. So, you know, who's to say? You never know what the courts are going to do. Well, again, I want to thank everybody for participating on the, on our panel discussion today. I really, really appreciate it. It was an excellent, excellent discussion. I hope everybody who dialed in enjoyed the conversation. Uh, we thank you very much for participating. Again, all of our material is up on our webpage, www.phoenix-center.org. Uh, some of our mini broadband stuff is actually, again, in our mini broadband category over there on the right side. And we have our stuff on our blog. So thank you very much, everybody, for participating. We'll catch you the next time. Thanks.